Okay, we will start now. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulullah wa ba'da. And aloha and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our third webinar titled Quantitative, Qualitative, and uh, Mixed Method Research. This webinar will discuss the characteristics of qualitative and quantitative research in applied uh, linguistics. And the qualitative and quantitative quantum from which the mixed methods research or MMR paradigms emerged. Mixed methods research is explained in terms of its three main varieties, its differences from multi methods research, and its capacity to combine the best features of qualitative and quantitative research by identifying connection and searching for convergence divergence and elaborations. Examples will be drawn from the presenter's recent experiences in various places around the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome or to introduce our uh, presenter, uh, Professor James Dean Brown. Uh, Professor Brown is a fellow professor at University of Hawaii at Manawa, Honolulu, since 1995. Uh, he was educated at University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He got his PhD in Applied Linguistics from University of California, Los Angeles in 1982, and his MA in TESOL in 1978. He published uh, around or more than 30 books and more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and box chapters in wide-ranging topics, including language curriculum development, language testing, language testing in Japan, testing second language pragmatics, performance testing, criterion reference language testing, ideas for classroom assessment, using surveys in language programs, doing quantitative and qualitative research, connected speech, quantitative research methods, mixed methods research, and heritage language curriculum. Uh, among his latest uh, books uh, are New Ways in Teaching Connected Speech, 2012, from TESOL. New Ways of Classroom Assessment Revised, 2013, from TESOL also. Uh, Practical Assessment Tools for College Japanese, 2013 with uh, Kondo Brown and Tomonika from NFLRC. Uh, it's another book is Mixed Methods Research for TESOL, was published in two, two, uh, 2014 from Edinburgh University Press. Also his book Cambridge Guide to Research in Language Teaching and Learning, published in 2015 with uh, Christina Combo from Cambridge University Press. And his another book is well, Statistics Corner, Questions and Answer about language testing was published in 2016. He served in the editorial board of different prestigious journals, such as TESO Quarterly, Language Testing, Language Learning and Technology. He was also the chair of 11 or more than 11 PhD dissertation committee and was a member of more than 35 PhD dissertation committee. Jedi has spoken and taught courses in more than 40 countries, ranging from Brazil to Yugoslavia. For example, Australia, Brazil, Canada, Chile, China, Colombia, Cuba, Cyprus, Egypt, Fiji Islands, France, Georgia, Germany, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Maldives Islands, Malaysia, Mexico, Morocco, Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, Northern Marine Islands, Oman, Peru, Russia, Senegal, Singapore, Taiwan, and so on. Uh, his area of expertise is uh, language testing, language curriculum development, language program evaluation, quantitative research methods, mixed methods research, and connected speech. 
I tried my best to summarize this CV that was more than 40 pages in the uh, few lines. So I, I will not take more time. I welcome you again. We have now more than 100 participants already in this room. I welcome you all from different parts of Saudi Arabia who are joining us. And uh, I will hand the mic to Professor Brown to uh, present the webinar. Uh, Professor Brown, the mic is yours, so you can start. Okay, thank you, Professor Al Hamami. Um, Salam alaikum and aloha to everybody. Uh, as uh, Professor Al Hamami mentioned, I'm here to talk today about quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods research. I assume because you are tuning into this webinar that you are interested in research methods. Uh, and so I'll be happy to talk with you and answer your questions specifically at the end of the uh, at the end of the two hours for about 20 minutes. Um, as Professor Al Hamami mentioned, my name is James Dean Brown, but I go by JD. So please feel free to call me JD, or uh, I believe that's the Arabic word Jadi uh, for little lamb. At any rate, JD Brown. Uh, and I've been at the University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, for the last 32 years. Uh, the way I'd like to approach this topic is by telling you a little bit about myself and about how my research interests have changed over the years. I think that will help you to uh, put into context uh, the quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods research that has, has developed over the years in applied linguistics in particular. Please notice in the title um, that I have an asterisk uh, that goes down to the bottom, <clears throat> which indicates that much of the information, uh, the tables and the figures in this workshop are taken from my book, the 2014 book called Mixed Methods Research for TESOL, which was published by Edinburgh University Press. Uh, if you're interested in the things that I talk about today, you'll get much fuller explanations in that book um, and the original, of course, uh, will give you much more time to digest these things, yeah? All right, so let's begin at the beginning. Uh, when I was, let me see if I can get this to move forward. There we go. When I was uh, growing up, basically through, through all of my youth, I was a musician. Uh, you can see behind me, in fact, uh, that I, I never get very far from my music. I've got my piano. Uh, at, at least four feet away from me at any given time. Uh, so I've always been very interested in music and I grew up uh, preparing to become a musician, uh, but I failed at the university uh, after two years of studying music and ended up in the, in the army where my hearing was damaged. And as a result, um, I, I couldn't do music anymore because I couldn't hear well enough. Uh, and so I switched from a French horn major to a French major uh, and became interested in languages, and that's how I stumbled into our field. Um, basically, I studied French uh, and other languages and studied in, in Europe uh, and discovered teaching of English there in France, where I was an assistant English teacher. And it was there that the spark for uh, applied linguistics was born. Uh, eventually, I found UCLA in 1976. And the reason I bring all of this up is because uh, in one of my early classes at UCLA, one of my professors, Professor Russ Campbell, um, was talking about things that you can do in applied linguistics, things that you can do in TESOL. Uh, and he talked about teaching, of course, and he talked about becoming an administrator, directing programs and such. He talked about getting rich by doing materials uh, publishing. And he talked about many things that you could do in the field. Uh, but at the very end of that talk, he mentioned something that he said nobody really likes to do or can do in language teaching, but every program needs one of these people. And he said, that's language testing. And the reason that people don't like to do it in language fields is because uh, it has a lot of mathematics involved. I don't know if you know this, but musicians um, often have a good sense of mathematics and are pretty good at it. Uh, and that was the case for me. And so I jumped at the chance to to delve into mathematics and all of my time at UCLA, the four years I studied there, um, I studied statistics in the education department, the ed psych department, along with my applied linguistics courses. 
um, and took a total of 11 different statistics courses, um, which prepared me pretty well to do statistical sorts of research. And so you can see that from the very beginning of my career, I was uh, a quantitative researcher and I favored the statistical side of things, largely because uh, I noticed in our field that uh, research in the 1970s anyway was very, very weak. Um, and I wanted to uh, help our field become better at doing research. And to me, research at that time was statistical research. And so uh, for the first 10 years of my time in the field, I uh, actually uh, made it my mission to help our field become better at uh, doing statistical research, uh, helping to do reviews of statistical research, and, and eventually writing a book that you see uh, cited here in the, in the very first figure, Brown 1988 which was designed to help uh, language teachers, language researchers understand statistics, understand statistical studies, and do better statistics. Uh, so you can see that my, my view of research at that time, which is summarized here in Noonan's chart, 1992, uh, taken essentially summarizing my 1988 views of research, that I saw research as being of two major types, primary research, which goes right to the the original data uh, and looks at the actual situation, and secondary research, which is essentially a research into the primary research or looking at various primary studies uh, and coming up with conclusions, yeah. Within the primary research, what I thought was going on was essentially case studies where researchers would look at individual learners or small groups of learners and try to understand language learning and language teaching better from that perspective. And statistical research, which was based typically on surveys and in my view on experiments or experimental uh, research uh, within our field. You can see that this is a very simple view of what research was. And I think that it was shared by many people in the field at that time. Um, as time went by, uh, in the next decade of my career, uh, I was, was realizing that learning to do statistical research is very, very difficult. Uh, it takes a lot of time. I studied at UCLA 11 courses, as I mentioned. But more importantly, I continued to learn about statistics over the years that followed much more than what I had learned in the courses themselves. Uh, so UCLA had actually just prepared me to read about research and learn more about research of the statistical type. <clears throat> and in thinking about this, I thought, what can I do that will help teachers, particularly uh, the MA students that I was, I was preparing for um, their careers or helping to prepare for their careers, what could I do for them that would help them do better research? And I realized that one of the types of research that they could do that wouldn't be terribly statistical, wouldn't require uh, complicated statistics, but could be done with relatively simple statistics was uh, survey research. And so uh, I wrote a book in 2001, published in 2001, that focused, as you can see in the middle of figure two here, on survey research, uh, particularly interviews and questionnaires. And figure two was presented in that book and in one other publication. Uh, and it shows a much more sophisticated view of what primary research really is. Yeah, so I'm focusing only on primary research in this book and, and I forget altogether about the secondary research. You can see that I've still got the qualitative research uh, at one end of a continuum and the quantitative research at the other end of a continuum uh, and that survey research sits right in the middle. Uh, that's largely because the survey research from my perspective at that time uh, involved both quantitative uh, information and qualitative information. So think about any survey that you've ever taken. They typically have what are called Likert scale kinds of questions and those Likert scale questions usually are like one to five or one to seven, and you respond uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree, choosing one of the numbers as your answer in response or, an, or relative to a given statement or question, yeah? Uh, and so 
there are lots of numbers that are generated by questionnaires. You can take the averages of, of different uh, questions combined, or you can look at the percentage of people who selected each option, one, two, three, or four, or five. Um, and, and you can generate uh, averages or means and, and percentages. And so statistics are definitely a part of survey research. But at the same time, any questionnaire that you've taken has probably had open-ended questions on it, uh, like what does research mean to you, and then you answer in your own, in your own words, uh, or uh, other co sorts of open-ended questions related to the Likert scale questions. Interviews also, of course, generate lots of qualitative data. Uh, and so the open-ended questions on questionnaires and the interviews, qualitative data, uh, indicate to me that surveys are both qualitative and the Likert scale questions make it quantitative. And so that's why I've, I've situated survey research right in the middle. You can also see that I have a much more sophisticated view of what qualitative research was. In figure one, it was just case studies. Um, but here I'm including introspection studies, uh, discourse analysis studies, interactional analysis, and classroom observations. And so there's a wider range of qualitative research in my view of the world at that time as well. I also realized that quantitative research comes in many different uh, flavors, if you will, different types. It can be descriptive, uh, the kinds of things that we do with questionnaires and, and interview counts, uh, frequencies and uh, percentages and simple averages or means and standard deviations and that sort of thing. Or it can be exploratory, including things like correlation coefficients or uh, more complicated things like regression analysis or uh, factor analysis. Or it can be quasi-experimental uh, or in the, I, the most ideal situations, it can be experimental. Uh, so again, my view of quantitative research has become much more sophisticated uh, in 2001, particularly because I was focused on survey research. The descriptive uh, statistics jumped out as more valuable to me, uh, realizing that combining uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, results from survey research, we could actually learn quite a bit with relatively simple statistics, um, but also recognizing that in many cases, uh, Quasi-experimental research is what we really do and not experimental research. Let me explain that really quickly. Experimental research by definition means that you sample randomly from some population. And the problem of course is that uh, it's very difficult in our field of language teaching to define a population that isn't relatively small. Uh, for example, if I try to do a study of all of the EFL learners, English as a foreign language learners in the world, I would have to somehow sample all of those millions and millions of learners out there uh, in a way that would make uh, my sample representative of that population. And I think you can see how that would be impossible. Uh, but it's almost equally impossible to sample experimentally uh, a representative sample of, say, all of the students, the EFL students learning uh, English in Saudi Arabia, uh, even if I limit that to the university level. So typically what we do is we sample much more narrowly and we say, okay, I took a random sample of all the students at uh, King College University, uh, a random sample, and that would be uh, experimental in a sense, but it's very limited in terms of how we can generalize those results to EFL learners outside of King College University. So what we really do is quasi-experimental research, which is more often based on particular institutions uh, and maybe uh, two classes um, are compared to two other classes. Uh, and that would be quasi-experimental research. So we're hedging our bets a little bit by calling it quasi-experimental. And it's okay, we need to realize that in our field, we really can't do experimental research of the sort that they do in medicine and other sciences, yeah. At any rate, you can see the wide range of research types that we had in my view in 2001. Um, and in my thinking in that 2004 article that I cite here, I began to realize that basically we have uh, a continuum of research types that are going on in our field. And I started thinking about that. 
uh, I was no longer dedicated wholly to the idea of quanti quantitative research because I was searching for ways that teachers and particularly MA students who have only two or three years to do their degree could actually learn enough to do decent research. Uh, and so I began to think a lot about how we could combine exploratory uh, qualitative research and experimental quantitative research. And this came about largely because of a, a friend of mine, a colleague that I met when I was teaching in Brazil on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, we were actually shopping for jewelry for my wife uh, when we were talking about research in the car. She was a, a really hardcore qualitative researcher. And at the time, I was still leaning toward being a quantitative researcher. And she said something to me that really made me think. She said, don't you think that you would be a better researcher if you could do both quantitative and qualitative? And I was already, uh, I had already published my book on, on, uh, on survey research, and I was thinking along these lines anyway. And I realized when she said that, that, that I had always been doing quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, let me step back a little bit. Uh, much of my work has been on research design, but I also do a lot of language testing stuff and also uh, language curriculum development, yeah? Uh, and in language curriculum development, you have, to, you have to gather information, for instance, in a needs analysis. You gather lots of information from students, from teachers, from administrators. Um, and from other consumers of, uh, and, and uh, stakeholders in, in a particular language program. And I was working on curriculum, for instance, in China for a couple of years, where <clears throat> I found myself using information from uh, teachers' meetings, information from interviews with students, information from uh, classroom observations, and so forth, all of which was very qualitative. And I was using that information to develop my questionnaires. Uh, and questionnaires then would go out to the whole of, all of the, the students, all of the teachers, all of the administrators involved in a particular program, where I could see if the qualitative information that I had gathered from the few people uh, actually applied to everybody. And so I, I realized that I had always been doing quantitative and qualitative research together. Uh, but that I was using the qualitative research to give me the ideas, uh, the background, the basis for uh, designing questionnaires, even for designing tests, um, that I would use then for gathering the quantitative information. And at the, in the early stages of these sorts of studies that I was doing, these sorts of curriculum development, I was using the qualitative information, but I was uh, basing all of my my conclusions on the quantitative information because I was privileging it. I was making it more important. I believed it was, it was more useful and more accurate somehow. Um, but in thinking about this article that I wrote in 2004, I mean, by the way, writing an article on something can help you learn a lot, uh, help, help you think through problems that you're having and, and ideas that you're trying to develop. Uh, and so, um, in thinking about this, I realized that our research types are not necessarily strictly quantitative, experimental, or qualitative, exploratory, but that our research types tend to fall on a continuum. Uh, I mean, if you let me back up one, I was already thinking like this in 2001, a continuum from qualitative through survey to quantitative. Uh, and so you see that... Uh, a survey research study might fall right in the middle of such a, uh, a continuum, um, but a quantitative study might actually fall over to the right, not being completely experimental, but being quasi-experimental or even including some qualitative information uh, to try to help understand what the numbers were trying to tell us. Similarly, a qualitative exploratory study might be purely qualitative, ethnographic or whatever, but it might also be uh, a bit quantitative as well. So we might learn things in a qualitative study that we want to, to see, to test uh, in a, on a larger group of people. And so we might then develop a questionnaire, which would put us on this end of the, the, the continuum, but uh, including both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, thus, we can slide a lot of uh, ways across this continuum. Um, and that could be in terms of the sorts of 
data collection methods that we use from non-experimental to experimental. So things like observations to highly experimental would be uh, data collection methods like tests and, and uh, Likert scale questions. Non-experimental would be things like observations and, and discussions and, and uh, focus groups and that sort of thing. Um, but a study might include both and therefore be situated somewhere along the continuum, not at one end or the other. There are many data types that we can, we can uh, vary within our studies in terms of data collection methods, data analysis methods, the degree of intrusiveness. Uh, so for instance, in a, in a qualitative study, if you're simply observing and not trying to intrude at all, but just watching, uh, that's one, one thing you can do. Another study might be highly interventionist in the sense that we set up a study under very highly controlled conditions. Uh, and so we're intervening and controlling things very uh, closely. Similarly, selectivity might be an issue. So a study may be very non-selective. The researcher remains very open to the types of information, data, variables, and so forth uh, that come in into the study. Are, are highly selective, like in a, a highly controlled uh, quantitative study where we only look at very precisely defined uh, and select a number of variables and control everything very, uh, very carefully. Uh, and so uh, we can also vary uh, in a study on, uh, in terms of variable description. So a variable in, in a qualitative study will tend to be something that we find in the study. So we'll be looking at our data and realize that the student motivation is very important and therefore we will we will focus on that so we're defining our variable out of the data whereas when we start a quantitative study we tend to uh, operationalize very carefully something like motivation with say uh, a Likert scale questionnaire developed by Gardner or Dornier or one of those fellows that do motivational research yeah uh, or we could do both and we could be somewhere along this continuum. Uh, so you see that in terms of all of these different aspects of research, um, the studies can vary along these continua in a general sense or very specifically. Other ways that they can vary is in terms of theory generation from hypothesis forming. In qualitative research, we are looking for hypotheses. In quantitative research, we tend to test hypotheses that we already have from the literature or from our experience. Uh, in terms of reasoning, qualitative research tends to be inductive. Uh, quantitative research tends to be deductive. In terms of the context, the context in, in qualitative research tends to be more natural, whereas in quantitative research, it's more controlled highly interventionist, highly selective, controlled. Um, and in time orientation, it's interesting that qualitative research tends to be or uh, can be more longitudinal. That is to say, if you're only studying one or a few uh, subjects, you can follow them across time, uh, which is valuable to see how people change across time. Whereas quantitative research tends to be cross-sectional in the sense that we, uh, we take data from a single time or from a single set of very narrowly defined times, pretest, post-test, or that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> and, and thus, we, we tend to think that uh, people who are of high proficiency, for example, uh, vary from people who are low proficiency in the same way that people who are, are beginning uh, are varying from people who are, are uh, advanced or have spent a lot of time on the task of language learning. Um, I'm not sure that we've ever proven that that's the case, that a cross-sectional study going from high proficiency to low proficiency represents the same thing as a, uh, as a longitudinal study that's from beginning or early stages to later stages in the language learning process. Um, and that's an issue that is worth talking about in its own right, but it is one way that qualitative and quantitative studies tend to vary. One of the most marked ways that this, this, the continuum uh, varies from qualitative to quantitative is in terms of small sample size to large sample size. Um, my wife's dissertation, for instance, was based on six kids here in Hawaii uh, who were heritage language learners of Japanese. Uh, she carefully selected six different types of kids who had grown up here uh, learning uh, Japanese at, at the University of Hawaii, uh, but with various backgrounds and, and six different kinds of backgrounds. And as a result, she had to describe them very, very uh, thickly, that is to say, in great depth. 
Uh, so you see in her dissertation that she goes on page after page, three or four pages about each of these different um, uh, six uh, people who she describes with pseudonyms in great detail. Uh, on the other hand, I've done studies with 24,000, more than 24,000 uh, people in them, and my studies tend to be very large, my quantitative studies. Uh, so you can see that one of the very, very clear ways in which qualitative and quantitative research varies is in terms of the number of participants. Uh, one of the things that qualitative researchers talk about particularly is the perspective uh, and from the qualitative research perspective, they are taking a more e emic or empathetic or insider view of uh, of the the study that they're observing or or participating in, uh, whereas the quantitative research tend to take an etic perspective, which is more of a top down uh, uh, sort of researcher looking down on the data and uh, not as as empathetic as the emic perspective. Um, and so those are some of the ways uh, that the primary research characteristics vary on a qual quan or qualitative quantitative research continuum that I talk about in my 2004 article. Um, and I hope that helps you to think about how our studies can vary. They can be purely qualitative or exploratory or they can be purely quantitative experimental uh, and they would have all of these char characteristics or all of these characteristics or they can situate themselves somewhere in the middle. And it's that that I, I was thinking about in 2004, 5, 6 um, when a friend, colleague, uh, John Norris uh, was sitting in a meeting with me and other colleagues um, and I was, I was trying to think about throughout the, the years, the 2000s, after 2004, how we can combine qualitative and quantitative research in such a way uh, that it will sort of maximize um, the, the contribution of things from all aspects of the research. And what I was thinking about basically was how can we use qualitative information to, to help us uh, cross-validate our quantitative information or vice versa, how can we use our quantitative information to cross-validate our, our qualitative uh, results? And so I was constantly thinking about uh, how we can strengthen our studies by cross-validation. And John Norris was talking in this meeting that I mentioned, um, and he mentioned something called mixed methods research. This meeting was in about 2004 or five, um, and he, he said that, that uh, such and such a study was was really not mixed methods research, it was multi-methods research. Um, and I was very interested in this because I didn't know what he was talking about, yeah? And when I don't know what one of my colleagues is talking about, I find that both irritating and, and intriguing. Uh, and so I stopped John afterwards and I asked what he meant by the difference between uh, multi-methods research and mixed methods research. Um, and he said that, well, in Patton's qualitative, uh, in his, in his uh, evaluation book, uh, he talked about um, combining qualitative and quantitative data uh, and that there was a literature developing in, in the education fields and in another field, psychology, that involved combining qualitative and quantitative research, which was called mixed methods research. And it was in its very early stages. Um, and, and this idea of mixed methods research intrigued me so much that I, I immediately started reading up on it. Um, and I found that there was a research dating back into the 80s, but it was very sparse until the 2000s, during which time uh, it burgeoned and, and a good deal of research or paper, a number of papers were being written on this idea of mixed methods research. Uh, and so I, I looked through that literature read pretty much all, everything that was written um, all the way back into the 80s and then all the stuff from the 2000s. Uh, and I was searching basically for a good definition of mixed methods research. And I was searching prodigiously for this idea of how can we cross validate with qualitative and quantitative, uh, cross validating each other uh, to make our studies stronger. It turns out that my thinking on that was a little bit off, um, but that's okay because I had started down a new path. I was no longer doing just quantitative research or doing quantitative and qualitative research together, uh, trying to think of how to combine them. Um, I was thinking about mixed methods research, 
Um, and I finally found a really good definition of that uh, in an article by Johnson, Ongwigbusi, and Turner in 2007, where they proposed a general definition of mixed methods research, MMR, uh, which was that mixed methods research is an intellectual and practical synthesis based on qualitative and quantitative research. And here's the key. It is the third methodological or research paradigm uh, along with qualitative and quantitative research. So we've got quantitative research paradigm. We've got the qualitative research paradigm, two paradigms that had been uh, essentially at odds with each other and criticizing each other brought together by uh, a third paradigm, which is the mixed methods research. MMR research furthermore recognizes the importance of traditional quantitative and qualitative research methodologies, but it also offers a third powerful paradigm choice that often will provide the most informative, complete, balanced, and useful research results. Uh, I really liked this definition because I saw that it would help me to find a way to combine uh, quantitative and qualitative research um, in a new way. Uh, and so I, I really focused and, and zeroed in on MMR research from that point forward. Elsewhere in that article, uh, they talk about uh, MMR research, but I, I went further and looked at, they talk about features of MR research, and I noticed that their list was rather incomplete, that I had a feeling there were other things out there in the literature. Uh, and so I looked across the entire literature trying to figure out what the features of MMR really were, the most salient features anyway. Um, and I found that uh, this list of seven features actually fairly well crystallizes what MMR research is, yeah. Uh, first of all, MMR research uses the logic of mixed methods research. Uh, so it's got its own special logic, uh, especially the fundamental principle of mixed methods research. And so that logic is based on a single uh, and important principle, which is that <clears throat> MR research, MMR research should strategically combine qualitative and quantitative methods approaches and concepts. So we're not just combining the, the research methods, but also the entire approaches and all concepts involved in a way that produces, and here's the real interesting thing, complementary uh, strengths and overlapping, non-overlapping, sorry, non-overlapping weaknesses. So the goal is in this principle to combine the approaches, methods, and concepts in such a way that they complement each other and therefore, uh, the strengths are emphasized and weaknesses are de-emphasized. Yeah. And so it makes the research stronger and that appealed to me a great deal. MMR research also generates its own research questions and provides answers to those questions as appropriate. And so this is where it dawned on me that, that you may have quantitative research questions in a study, you may have qualitative research questions in a study, but you may have other research questions in a study, MMR research questions, that actually focus on how do I combine or what do I learn from the combination of qual and quant. Third, MMR takes into account all on-site social, political, and resource-oriented needs and concerns. Uh, and so what I have found in my own research is that when you use MMR research, you inevitably end up taking into account what's going on in the setting that you are uh, studying. And so um, that le le leads to this third characteristic or this third salient feature of MMR. Fourth, MMR uh, borrows features from both qualitative and quantitative research as appropriate. And so you're not bound to be a qualitative researcher or a quantitative researcher, I'm sorry, but you are, are selective in what you, what you uh, use in each to, to make your MMR study stronger. And fifth, MMR simultaneously or sequentially. So notice simultaneously would be the idea of cross-sectional research or sequentially, that's the idea of longitudinal research, integrates qualitative and quantitative points of view, data collection methods, forms of analysis, interpretation techniques, and modes of, modes of drawing conclusions as appropriate to the logic of mixed methods research. Now, the research that I was looking at was talking about 
or simultaneously or sequentially, but I realized in my own research that in a sense you can also combine the simultaneous and sequential uh, in an MMR study. Uh, so that would, I would add to the fifth point. Sixth, MMR should only be used when mixed methods research is likely to produce results superior to those likely to be produced by either qualitative or quantitative research methods alone. Uh, let me emphasize this uh, because in talking about mixes, mixed methods research with my colleagues in my department, I found some resistance from some of them um, because it would seem that when you talk about mixed methods research, you are invalidating the sorts of research that they do. So some of my colleagues, for instance, use uh, conversational analysis or uh, interactional analysis techniques uh, exclusively. Uh, and they do very good research, yeah. They're qualitative methods and they do very, very good research, which combined with other researchers over time leads to conclusions that are very interesting for our field. Uh, and so pure qualitative research in that sense is probably the best way for them to proceed. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there are times when I do quantitative research. I do considerable amount of quantitative research every year. That's pure quantitative research. Um, and it wouldn't make much sense to uh, add qualitative research, except perhaps to help me understand my quantitative research. Uh, and so I'm focused very much on quantitative research methods sometimes. But there are other times, and that's when uh, mixed methods research will lead to superior results where where I will combine my research methods, um, quantitative and qualitative, using mixed methods techniques to better understand both uh, or the situation involved. Um, and basically, fifth, or I'm sorry, seventh, mixed method research aims to produce useful and defensible research results. And so six and seven, in a way, combine. I mean, if you're using the best method, qualitative, quantitative, or mixed methods to produce superior results, they will probably be results that are most useful and at the same most are the most defensible uh, in your particular research situation, yeah? Uh, and I think usefulness and defensibleness within our field are very important. Applied linguistics needs to produce results that teachers can use, um, that linguists can use, uh, other applied linguists can use, uh, and they need to be able to defend those results uh, to various communities. Uh, and of course, there are communities that uh, really only believe in qualitative results, uh, and so having mixed methods results that show quantitative uh, uh, aspects will help them to understand and it will be defensible your research to those people. Similarly, the quantitative communities sometimes uh, poo-poo the qualitative research and really will only focus on the quantitative research. So in a sense, <clears throat> doing the research type that's appropriate for a particular community makes it more useful and defensible. Uh, but at the same time, mixed methods research may be uh, more defensible and useful to all communities in one way or another because it has aspects of both. Uh, so these are the features of mixed methods research that got me excited and interested uh, in doing this kind of research. Uh, you'll see that I have uh, taken here from Johnson, Ongwig, Boozy, and Turner's 2007 article uh, a diagram that shows that they distinguish between pure mixed methods research, which gives equal status to both quantitative and qualitative sides of the research, uh, and then at the one end, pure quantitative research, which would be uh, only quantitative and have no qualitative aspects, at the other end, qualitative research, which only has qualitative aspects, yeah. Um, but in between, there are, is various qualitative research that uh, would be called mixed. That is to say, it's mostly qualitative, but it has some aspects of quantitative, would put it here, or is equal, uh, equally in the middle between pure and qualitative. Similarly, quantitative research can have aspects of qualitative research uh, that would make it quantitative mixed. These distinctions are um, not necessarily useful in their own right, but rather should help you to think about how you could say in a quantitative study, uh, say a, a, a survey study where you have Likert scale data uh, where you're talking about the means and the percentages of people who selected each each item and, and how people 
uh, responded to those questionnaires, um, but you look at the qualitative results in your study as a way of helping you to understand the answers that you got in the quantitative study, and that would put you here. It's not a pure quantitative study, but more a quantitative mixed study somewhere uh, in between, or if they're given equal status in the study, then it would be pure mixed. Uh, so maybe it can help you think about uh, the ways that your research will shape up over time, yeah? Okay, uh, I don't want to dwell on this. <coughs> Before we take a break, I want to talk a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of qualitative and quantitative sides of MMR. Um, and in table one, uh, which is very small print, so let me use a new trick that I've learned. Uh, you can zoom in. And so I will zoom in here. <coughs> Qualitative research and, and uh, quantitative research, as you see in the table, can have both strengths, which you see in gray, or weaknesses, which you see in white. So the strengths of quantitative research in the bottom uh, right quadrant and the strengths of qualitative research are in the upper left, and, and the weaknesses are in the other quadra quadrants, yeah. Uh, and it's interesting to look at and compare the the strengths and weaknesses of the two types of research, which are sort of inherent in them. And it's interesting to note that in almost all cases, they are, they are complete opposites in some sense. Uh, so one of the strengths of qualitative research is that it's exploratory in nature. That is to say that you can get surprises. And in fact, if you don't get surprises, as one of my colleagues uh, in my department puts it, if you don't get surprises in your qualitative research, you're not doing it right. Um, and so it's a wide open sort of uh, form of research that, that's full of, that you can explore new ideas and find new things that you hadn't thought of before. In contrast, uh, one of the weaknesses of quantitative research is that it's not so exploratory in nature. Uh, you're more likely to find things you don't expect as anomalies and maybe even reject them because they don't fit your expectations. Uh, you're not likely to find surprises um, because in fact, you're really only going to find answers to things that you predicted a priori. That is to say, you're really only likely to find answers to questions that you asked. Yeah. Uh, whereas in qualitative research, you're, you can find all kinds of things that you didn't expect. Um, uh, and so there, in, in qualitative research, you have a wide range of possible data. In quantitative research, uh, you're going to use theory-based pre-assigned categories that may not reflect reality, uh, express, especially as they're perceived by local participants and, and so forth. Uh, and so if you look at this chart in detail, you'll notice that the two sides really are complementary in a sense. And that leads me to the conclusion that if you were to focus only on the strengths of qualitative and the strengths of, of uh, quantitative research, uh, that you would actually be uh, co you compensating for the weaknesses in the other form of research. It's almost a natural pairing uh, to, if you look at the strengths. And so in the next, in the next table, table two, I show only the complementary strengths of qualitative and quantitative research sides of MMR. And this makes it much easier to think about um, in terms of designing your own study. Yeah. Uh, and if you in fact have, sorry, <clears throat> if you in fact want to have an exploratory aspect to your study, then qualitative uh, aspects to your study will help. Hmm, I'm having trouble staying with my slide. Here we go. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if you use quantitative data, they will and ad adequate sampling procedures and sample size, uh, that your results will be relatively generalizable. Uh, and so you can look at this table and pick three, four, or five of these rows, perhaps, and and set up your study in a way that will actually uh, make it much, much stronger. I'm not suggesting that you should try to do all of these things, um, but these are the options that you have in terms of complementary strengths of qualitative and quantitative research sides of MMR that may help you choose uh, how you design your study to make it absolutely as strong as you possibly can through M MMR techniques. Okay, well, let's get started again. I see that we we had 139 people when I started the break, and we've got 136, so we're doing very well. Only three people dropped out. Um, on a personal note, I'm looking out the window 
and the sun is up. We had a nice sunrise here in Hawaii. Uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning here, uh, and I'm looking forward to a nice long day while you, you folks are all getting ready to go to sleep. Uh, at any rate, uh, let's get back to business. To review a little bit, I'd like to point out that people have been very important in my development over the years. If you think back on what I said earlier, I, I mentioned that Russ Campbell, Dr. Russ Campbell, was my professor at UCLA, uh, and he got me interested ultimately in quantitative research uh, by talking about the things we could do in the field, um, and and that as a quantitative researcher, I didn't really start to change my view of the world until another person, a colleague in Brazil, who was doing jewelry shopping with me, uh, suggested that perhaps I'd be a better researcher if I could do both quantitative and qualitative research, which of course made me realize that I had been doing both types of research in my curriculum work all along. Uh, and then the next shift came when uh, John Norris mentioned uh, Quantity, I'm sorry, when he mentioned mixed methods research versus uh, multi-methods research. Uh, uh, and so you can see that people have been a very important part of my life, and I credit those people with helping me to change and turn my, my life around in different ways in my research uh, as well. Uh, let me, before I move forward, talk about that distinction between mixed methods research and multi-methods research. I mean, the definitions that I gave you above for mixed methods research all emphasize the idea of, of a third paradigm of combining things somehow um, in a way that, that adds uh, value to the research. What John was talking about in terms of multi-methods research is just putting a bunch of qualitative and quantitative methods together without looking at how they, they cross uh, and, and, and uh, enrich each other that would be multi-methods research. And many of the studies in our field that call themselves mixed methods research are in fact multi-methods research. That is to say, they have qualitative and they have quantitative, but they make no effort to take that third step, which is to look at how the combined results uh, can be enriched by looking at them uh, together. And so that's the distinction that John Norris was making between mixed methods research and multi-methods research. Yeah. All right, now I want to get a little bit more practical uh, and look at uh, actual data. Uh, here we go. Um, let me explain these data and where they're coming from. Uh, there are no numbers here, as you can see. Whoops, here, as you can see. Uh, they're just words. Yeah, and so these must be qualitative data. Uh, back in the, I guess it was in the 2000s, maybe in the late 90s, I was asked to do a study uh, in a North African country that I'll call Country X. Um, it's a obviously a Muslim country, uh, a former French colony uh, that that uh, wanted to have me come and look at their English language programs uh, in high school and junior high school. Uh, and I jumped at the chance. The study was sponsored by the Ministry of Education in that country, and uh, the United States State Department, um, who paid uh, a good deal of my expenses, yeah. Uh, and it was an interesting study to do, um, but I didn't want to do it the way they wanted me to do it. They, they sent me the previous study, one that had been done five or ten years earlier, and it was essentially a page and a half um, write-up by somebody who had gone in and evaluated the materials uh, that they were using in their high schools and junior high school. Um, and that was called an evaluation study. Um, and so I, I planned ahead and got agreement from the State Department and from the Ministry of Education to, a much, to do a much more comprehensive study of the English teaching in the country. And what I had in mind was gathering both qualitative and quantitative data uh, to uh, help me understand basically what the teachers and students wanted the ministry and the uh, administrators to understand. And so I learned very early that, that there were three groups of people that I was going to focus on. Um, one was the students, of course, <clears throat> who are always important in any situation. And another was the teachers, 
in country X. And finally, the inspectors. It turns out that because they were a former uh, French colony, they, they had a sort of French system of inspectors. That is to say, administers, administrators, uh, each of whom was responsible for, say, 1,000, 2,000, maybe 3,000 teachers uh, within the country in different districts, yeah. As I recall, there were 40 or 50 of these inspectors, yeah. Uh, and so um, I, I wanted to uh, work with the inspectors. I wanted to learn from the inspectors. And so the, the powers that be uh, set up uh, meetings with the inspectors for three days where we would talk together about the issues in the country as English teaching in high school and junior high school. Uh, but I also wanted to, um, to go on site. So I went uh, to five different cities, yeah, in different regions of the country, uh, which of course gave me a good opportunity to see Country X as a tourist, uh, but also gave me a good opportunity to get a sort of uh, overview of how English teaching varied across different regions in the country. Uh, and so then uh, in each of those regions, for instance, in Tunis, I was, uh, I would go to one of the high schools in the area and I would meet with the principal, of course, and drink coffee uh, and talk uh, and essentially get his permission to, to go into his school. And then he would introduce me to one teacher who I would talk with and that teacher would take me to his class and I would observe his class. And then after that class, uh, the students would stay with me. So this was all arranged ahead of time, would stay with me for an hour. And I would talk with them uh, with uh, an interpreter. Uh, Mohammed uh, was my helper there from the State Department. Uh, and he helped me uh, interpret Arabic. Uh, and, and of course, uh, I speak some French. So I was able to, to talk with the students if they spoke French. Uh, and in English as well. But the low-level students, of course, relied more on Arabic, and the high-level students were more interested in using English. Uh, at any rate, so I spent an hour with the students, and then I went back and talked to the teacher uh, a little bit more for clarification and to thank him for letting me into his classroom and so forth. And then I would have lunch, uh, uh, usually with the teacher, with the State Department people that I was working with, and also with uh, the principal sometimes. Uh, and typically we had couscous and uh, some chopped salad. You know, I ate a lot of couscous in this North African country. Um, and then in the afternoon, if I had gone to a junior high school in the morning, I would go to a senior high school in the afternoon in that same region. Um, and then I would go through the same routine with the principal and the teacher and the class class observation and, and the uh, student meeting and then the teacher meeting. And, and, and then I would leave basically and have dinner. Uh, which was often couscous and chopped salad. Um, and then in the evening, I would meet with teachers from that region. Uh, so that first meeting in Tunis, the teachers from uh, that region who were interested in finding out what I was trying to do uh, and giving me input or whatever. Yeah. And, and so that was my basic schedule. And I did that in five different cities. Uh, thus, I observed 10 different schools, uh, talked with 10 different teachers on two occasions, met with students in 10 different classes, um, and met with uh, principals in 10 different schools and so forth, yeah. Uh, remember that I also met with the uh, inspectors at the beginning before all of this happened. So uh, basically, I gathered a lot of qualitative data uh, along the way. Uh, and that, th th those qualitative data uh, over the course of two weeks, uh, I worked on questionnaires and I would try the questionnaires on different people as I went along. Uh, basically, I was trying to refine a questionnaire that would help me find out what of the things that I was learning qualitatively in my meetings and, and observations and so forth, what of that was useful uh, to try to find uh, a more generalizable and more to find out what more people thought. So if I had talked to 10 classes of students, I wanted to have a questionnaire for students uh, so that I could get hundreds of students' opinions on those same issues to see if what I was finding qualitatively was working quantitatively um, and so forth. The same with the teachers um, and the administrators to some degree as well. Yeah. Um, and so over those weeks, I, I developed three questionnaires, one for the students, one for the teachers, and then one for the, the uh, uh, inspectors. Yeah. 
It's worth noting that I, I met with the inspectors for two days after all of this happened at the end of my visit, and I had the questionnaires ready. And so on the first day of that last, last set of meetings with the inspectors, I gave them the questionnaires that I had and asked for their input. <coughs> Sorry. I did a good deal uh, of note taking at that point. Uh, they gave me good insights into how the questions could be worded better or how I should add this question or subtract that question and so forth. And then the next day, overnight, I had revised the three sets of questionnaires uh, and, and had a final or at least semi-final uh, version of the questionnaire uh, that I I asked them to look at one last time. I asked them to take the inspector's questionnaire. So I now had 40 or 50 uh, sets of questionnaires from the ins one group of people, the stakeholders who called themselves inspectors or the administrators. Yeah. Uh, and then I asked uh, Mohammed to, to uh, translate the questionnaire so that the students would see uh, the English and Arabic uh, and, and be able to answer the questions with full understanding of the questionnaire. Uh, and to distribute that then to schools around the country uh, and this, to do the same for the teachers. Uh, I don't know if we translated the teachers one. I don't think it was necessary because the teachers had pretty good English. But at any rate, uh, questionnaires went out then after I left Country X uh, to teachers and students. And then Mohammed uh, collected those and entered the data uh, for me, qualitative data like what you're seeing here uh, and quantitative data. Uh, which we'll look at in a second, yeah, uh, from the questionnaires. Uh, so the, the qualitative data that you're looking at here are data from two questions. One, I asked them what the most positive aspects of the English teaching curriculum, uh, of the English teaching was uh, in their school, in their experience, and what the most negative features were of that. Uh, so this is from teachers, yeah, and I'm asking them the positive and negative features of the, the English teaching in the country, yeah. And you can see that we got a wide range of different possible answers uh, from them. Uh, for example, in terms of positive aspects, one teacher wrote, teaching English in this country has made a great shift from what we've been taught. Contextualized, motivating tasks are now introduced. And so you can see that that teacher is hopeful that that teacher uh, recognizes that, that while they may have been taught using audiolingual methods, that the language teaching nowadays was more contextualized, more motivating, and that task-based stuff was being used. Um, and so I looked at that and I thought, okay, what is that about, basically? And I wrote curriculum there, yeah? Uh, and then in, in the second uh, data point, I've got the objectives set by the curriculum are good and the wide variety of activities presented by the textbook. And I thought, what is that? That's also curriculum, yeah? Uh, and then textbooks are enriched with the illustrations and activities. Well, that's clearly textbook. And textbook meets the, the most of the uh, writ written tests, and I wrote textbook there as well. And so you can see what I'm doing is I'm categorizing each of these things. Eventually, curriculum changed, and I had some other label for that, as I recall, because of what I was finding later. Uh, but a lot of these are about textbooks. Some of them are about uh, the approaches involved. Some of them are about the testing and so forth, uh, the activities. And basically, I was looking for general categories going through hundreds and hundreds of data points uh, that would be used to summarize these things. Yeah, and then I went through the, the negative aspects as well. <coughs> And I was able to find uh, categories for those uh, also. So uh, basically, that was how I said about analyzing the data. You can see that what I used was an Excel spreadsheet, Excel uh, spreadsheet, uh, and that for me, that works pretty well. Over here on the right, I've got the place uh, identified for each of these com uh, coming from the questionnaires. Where was the questionnaire from? In the end, I abandoned that because it didn't turn out to be very useful. Uh, but basically, Excel spreadsheet is a way of uh, manipulating data, entering data, manipulating data, categorizing data so that I could put my categories here and then I could sort all of this on those categories and it would put, say, all of the textbook comments, positive comments together. And that would help me to then 
analyze what they were saying about the textbooks and what they were saying about the classroom teaching and what they were saying about the testing. And so you can see that I used this uh, as a way of, used the Excel spreadsheet as a way of uh, analyzing my data, classifying my data, analyzing my data, uh, and sorting through it and trying to figure out what was going on. But that's not the only way I could have done it. I could have equally well put each of these comments and the category on, on flashcards and then gotten down on the floor and sorted them. Uh, but you can see that uh, one way or another, you need to sort of categorize uh, what the comments are, uh, figure out how these things are related to each other, um, and then sort them and look at them and try to figure out what, what each of the categories represents in terms of what they're saying positively and negatively. In fact, the fact that I had positive questions and a negative question indicates that I was already kind of sorting or getting them to sort their thinking about the positive aspects and negative aspects of what they were, they were experiencing in their teaching world. Yeah. Um, and so this gives you a glimpse of one of the ways that I analyzed the, the qualitative data. Uh, and you can think about this in terms of using Excel for your own uh, purposes or, or using file cards or using uh, large pieces of paper and drawing lines and connections between them. Whatever works for you, that's the important way to analyze your qualitative data. But the steps involved will probably involve some sort of categorizations, um, positive or negative in this case, the categorizations that I used in this column and in this column, um, the sorting, uh, the, and then the reading over and over and over, going through your data over and over again and trying to understand them. Let the data talk to you uh, in a way that will help you, yeah? Um, in terms of analyzing the quantitative data, I also use the spreadsheet here. And you can see that uh, what I've done is entered numbers. And so for each questionnaire, in this case, I've got IDs uh, 1 through 30. There were many, many hundreds more than that. Uh, these are uh, must be student level student data from different cities again the five different cities uh, junior high school and senior high school level what grade they were in uh, their gender uh, and their age these gender age grade uh, junior high school level and cities I used largely in describing the participants in my report yeah so it was important for me to be able to describe who had answered my questionnaire so that I could understand the, the results better and so that my readers could understand the results better as well it's also true uh, then that I wanted to know on average what was the average age what was the average answer to question one question two question three so for each person I've got their bio data information and then their answer five three one three I'm sorry five three one five three five five to each of the questions and so for each question and each variable that's numerical I can I can calculate things like the number n the mean the average the standard deviation which is a sort of average of how they vary away from the mean the lowest or minimum uh, age in this case, the maximum age in this case, and then the range. So the minimum was 13, uh, 13 years old and the maximum was 20 years old. Um, there were 29 people in this group of data. The average age was 15.69, almost 16. The standard deviation was almost two and a half. Uh, and the range was eight, um, 20 minus three, um, 20 minus 13 plus one. Uh, and you can see that what I'm doing is functions using Excel functions. And so I used count F2 to F31. What's F2? F2 to F31. So that's this range. I'm telling it to do that range over and over again. So in that range, count, give me the average, give me the standard deviation, give me the minimum, give me the maximum. So these functions will actually calculate that for you. If I type count, uh, equal count, parenthesis, parenthesis, F2 colon F31, and then hit enter, I get a 29 there. It's telling me that 29 people gave me their age. Uh, and so uh, the average, I did the same thing and it gave me 15.69 and so forth. So these functions are very, very useful. And you can see, that if you copy these functions, so once you type them in here, if you, oops, if you copy them, 
if you copy them, wow, if you copy them from here across to here, so just copy, block this, copy it across here, it will give you those same statistics then for all of these uh, columns, yeah, which is very useful indeed uh, and very quick. It's, it's slow to do the first first column, but then after that, it's very quick. And so you can see that I have the number of people who answered each item. I have the averages on each item, some of which are uh, relatively low, others are high. Um, I have the standard deviations, some of which are, uh, they all range around one, but some are higher and others are lower. Um, and so forth. I've got the, the lowest answer, the highest, so nobody answered one on the first question. Uh, everybody, the, the, the full range of, of answers were chosen here, but nobody answered two or one on question number, whatever it is, three, four, yeah, and so forth. So I have a lot of information very quickly, uh, and of course I based it on hundreds, but it didn't take any longer to calculate uh, for hundreds than it did for, for this third sample of 29. Uh, 30 rather, yeah. Uh, so at any rate, that gives you some idea how Excel uh, and a little bit of exploration in Excel of how the functions and the formulas equal F7, so equal the cell F7, F37, that would be this one, F37, minus this one, F36 plus one equals eight, yeah. Uh, how that, the, the algebra or the, the formulas and the functions can be used to, to give you all of the information you would need in a study like this of the Likert scale questions, yeah? Uh, so I had qualitative analyses and I had quantitative analyses from uh, students, teachers, and, and inspectors, and ultimately my report uh, was based on all of that, uh, and it made a much more uh, comprehensive study than I would have gotten had I used just one or the other. At any rate, explore these ideas that I've shown you for uh, analyzing qualitative data and quantitative data, uh, and you can get, go a long ways in your research with actually fairly simple uh, statistics and and uh, qualitative analyses. Yeah. Um, the results of the quantitative analyses I presented like this. So for each of the questions in the student questionnaire with 304 questionnaires, for each of the, the questions that I asked, so about the textbook for English course, is it effective? Uh, the mean was 3.97, standard deviation 1.11, and they ranged from one to a maximum of five. And you can see that uh, I've got the percentage then of people who answered each of the options and you can see quite clearly uh, that uh, the most popular option was five in this case. Um, I'm having trouble seeing it. There it is. Yeah, because 44.08% chose it. Uh, and so the percents of people who selected each of the options was a very useful way of looking at the questions. So for question three, for instance, uh, the pace of the cassette tapes is appropriate. They strongly disagreed. 50, almost 56% of the people said they strongly disagree with that. Uh, that the, uh, basically, they think the cassette tapes are, uh, most of the people think they're too strong, uh, too fast, yeah, um, and so forth. So, I mean, there's a lot you can learn from a questionnaire with just these mean standard deviation, min, max, and the percentage of people who picked each option. Notice that this table is very clear, and this is actually a good way to present things. Also notice that this table is in question order, but that the next table I've rearranged using Excel, I was able to sort all of these, all of this from high to low means and then uh, copy it back into my Word document. And you see that the highest mean is I enjoy learning English, which is a, a good thing to know about. These students really enjoy learning English uh, and you can see a very high percentage of them said that. Uh, the teaching helps me learn is a little bit lower, but still they, they do respect their teachers and what they're getting in the classroom. The textbook printing, spacing, and layout are well done, and so forth. And so you can interpret your data in terms of, say, means of four or above, or um, even, say, 4.23 and above. In terms of what they like, uh, you can also interpret it in terms of things that they don't like, like the cassette tapes are not appropriate. The number of English per week is sufficient for learning. Uh, they don't think that's the case, yeah. 
Um, they, it turns out as I, I delved into this question, they're not particularly happy about the amount of material in the textbook. When I looked at the qualitative data and I looked at what the teachers were saying and when I looked at the textbooks themselves, I realized that the problem is that there's way too much material in the textbooks to be covered in the amount of time allotted for them and so forth. Yeah, it's interesting to also compare questions like the cassette tape helps me learn English, which is much higher than the, the speed of the, t the cassette tapes is appropriate. Uh, and to think about that and to look at the qualitative data. And so you can see that thinking about the numbers and comparing them to what you're learning in the qualitative data can help you learn an awful lot with relatively small number of statistics, relatively simple statistics, yeah? Um, one of the most important things that goes on in, in mixed methods research is triangulation. Uh, this comes from qualitative research traditions. And typically, I have found it very useful uh, to think about all of the different kinds of triangulation, which I show in this table. But since I'm running out of time, I'm going to just let you take a look at it. But the most common types of triangulation that I've used are uh, data triangulation, like the one in, t in country X, where I use multiple sources of information, students, teachers, and administrators. Uh, you can also use investigator triangulation, but that's often uh, hard to get colleagues to cooperate with. Theory triangulation, which uh, you look at your data from error analysis or discourse analysis or com communicative fluency perspectives, so different theoretical perspectives. That's also an interesting way to go, but I typically haven't used it. So I have used data triangulation. I have used method triangulation, which is also called overlapping methods. Um, and this involves they're using like interviews, uh, questionnaires, classroom observations, meetings, and so forth, multiple uh, methods. So data triangulation, students, teachers, and administrators, uh, method triangulation, interviews, observations, questionnaires, and so forth. Um, and maybe uh, as I did in the country X study, location triangulation where I used five different cities or where I used different kinds of schools uh, as uh, ways of triangulating. So I had basically three kinds of triangulation in my study in, in country X. Um, and that, that led to at least five times, three times, uh, four or five uh, different sets of data, uh, which is a huge number if you multiply it out. And you can see that uh, it can become very complicated very quickly if you don't limit yourself to two or three kinds of triangulation. Um, there are some things to think about with regards to triangulation, but I'm going to have to skip those as well because of time. Uh, but consider these issues as they show, they're shown on the slide. If you want to look again when uh, you look at the recording, uh, you'll be able to look at that. Uh, and also some things to worry about, ways to get around the pitfalls that, that triangulation presents. Uh, but I don't want to get into that as, uh, in depth either. It is also true that there are characteristics of sound uh, quantitative and qualitative research, which we've often talked about in terms of consistency, fidelity, verifiability, and meaningfulness. These issues are dealt with in one way in qualitative research and other ways in qualitative research. It's quantitative, quantitative on this side and qualitative on this side. Uh, and this is the way that they are dealt with. Yeah, If I had three or four hours, we could talk about these things in depth. Um, but again, the, the book is there. Um, from Edinburgh Press and you can get much more information about how different uh, strategies are used uh, in quantitative research to deal with reliability, validity, replicability, and generalizability, and how different types of triangulation are used in, in qualitative research to deal with parallel dependability, credibility, confirmability, and transferability issues. Yeah. Um, it's also true that the literature based specifically on Ongwig, Busi, and Johnson's 2006 article on mixed methods research has delved into ideas of legitimation as ways of thinking about how the two types of research can combine. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, are fairly technical and don't help the researcher uh, very much at a level that's practical. Uh, but again, they are there in the literature and they deal with issues of integrating samples, uh, integrating the emic and etic or the inside outside uh, perspectives, making sure that the weaknesses are minimized by, by focusing on the strengths, the idea of lo long, long <laughs> longitudinal or sequential uh, 
combinations of data, how we convert our data between quantitative and qualitative, uh, and how uh, mixing the two uh, paradigms are actually maximizing the, the results, uh, how commensurability or switching and integrating the different worldviews between quant and qualitative are affecting your results, and finally, how multiple validities, how multiple validities are helping uh, to understand your, your study and uh, how the political uh, aspects come, come through in your data. But as I said, this is very technical and not very helpful. Much more helpful, you'll find table six, <clears throat> where I finally became aware of how we need to combine the data between quantitative and qualitative studies uh, in our mixed methods research. Yeah. And so the idea of how the data converge or how the data sources uh, cross validate or support similar conclusions, uh, I call that convergence in this table. Uh, and basically that is an interesting thing. Uh, and you will find that sometimes uh, your data are cross validating, they are converging and that is really, really nice. But it's fairly rare that they will be 100% converging. And in fact, they're likely to diverge in, in a number of different ways. And I find after doing studies like the Country X study, that the divergence is actually more interesting sometimes than the convergence because the div divergence is where you find uh, contradictions, anomalies, surprises uh, uh, that don't necessarily lead to the conclusions that you expected, but may lead in interesting ways uh, to other uh, conclusions, conclusions that can further the, the field, can further your research, um, maybe better than the, uh, the ideas that converged, yeah. Uh, and so, for example, uh, you may find that uh, in the questionnaire, your students rated, uh, rated uh, pair work very low and group work very low, but the teachers rated them very high. And so you go to your qualitative data to help you understand that, and you see that what's going on is that the students don't think they can learn from each other. They want the teacher to teach them, uh, and the teachers are trying to get the students to learn by practicing. Uh, and so that indicated to me that one suggestion I could make in this teaching situation was uh, that perhaps the teachers need to communicate better that what they're trying to do is put the students into a low threat situation where they can practice using the language. They're not learning from the other students, they're learning from themselves uh, from by practicing, that sort of thing, yeah. Uh, and divergence led me to that conclusion. Divergence will often lead you to such conclusions. You may also find things in one set of data that help elaborate. And so you may find something in your quantitative uh, data that's interesting, but when you look at the qualitative data, you, you understand it much more fully, more, more elaborately. Or you may find something that's confusing in your uh, quantitative data, and by looking at your qualitative data, find clarification that will help you understand it. Um, and that can happen in the reverse as well. So looking in your data for convergence, divergence, elaboration, and clarification uh, in stages, one after the other, may help you to really come to understand your data much, much better. And finally, um, it may be the case that one set of data helps to uh, exemplify. This often works from quantitative to qualitative. So you find something, a pattern in your quantitative data uh, and then you are able to explain it perhaps in the discussion section of your study by using the words um, uh, of the qualitative data, taking quotes from the teachers or from the students that are actual examples of what you're finding in your numbers. When you're communicating with teachers or you're communicating with language administrators, it's always useful to use words to do so, uh, always explaining your numbers in words so that the teachers are not alienated by the the uh, quantitative aspects of your study. And finally, the idea of interaction, when you're moving back and forth, looking for convergence, divergence, elaboration, clarification, and exemplification, you may find uh, that there are aspects of credibility and validity of your interpretations that you need to emphasize to your readers. Uh, and so I would think about these six things and not worry so much about these technical aspects of legitimation, looking at your qualitative data, looking at your quantitative data, and thinking about them in maybe six, six different stages uh, will help you to draw out things that are mixed methods above and beyond looking at the connections uh, between the different types of data. Um, MMR is simpler than it seems. I mean, it is not the case that, that 
you have to use all of the strategies for enhancing and demonstrating your study that that you'll see in the book. It's not uh, necessary that you have to use all of the concepts that I've discussed today, uh, but rather to select from them uh, those that will help you get where you need to be in terms of telling the story that your data are trying to communicate with you. The choices that the research ma researcher makes are, are governed by your constraints in the study uh, and should be guided by factors that will help to maximize the power and clarity of your study. Um, and if you use the appropriate and sufficient strategies um, in analyzing your data, they will tend to become mixed methods research, uh, though I would say that the last point I'm going to make may be very important that you should have probably mixed methods research questions that will force you uh, to think about mixed methods toward the end of your study as well. It's also important to remember that no study will ever be perfect, uh, but that more arguments in favor of a study's quality, so talking about your study and explaining it to your researcher in terms of why the quantitative data are useful, why the qualitative data are useful, and why the mixed methods uh, research analyses that that uh, imp that you implemented as well uh, enhanced your study. Uh, those those more arguments, making more arguments, will be more convincing than having a few arguments. Yeah. So mixed methods researchers should definitely try to build mixed methods uh, research arguments about convergence, about divergence, elaboration, clarification, exemplification, and interaction. Um, and to help you do so. It's probably useful to have MMR research questions. So as I suggested earlier, you may want to have a couple of quantitative research questions. Uh, these tend to be the kinds of things. Um, are there differences uh, in the means between answers about textbooks and, and curriculum development? Uh, uh, are, there, are there significant differences between uh, the means for students and teachers on textbook uh, evaluation, that sort of thing. Um, but you may also want to have qualitative research questions, which tend to be things like, uh, what are the teacher's views uh, about the textbooks as compared to the student's views? Uh, and so they're more open-ended uh, sorts of research questions. Maybe you want to have two quantitative, two qualitative, and then two at the end that will force you back to thinking about uh, the mixed methods aspect of your study. And so those will tend to be things that you revisit. You start your study with, say, six research questions, two, two, and two. And then in your discussion section, maybe you discuss, you discuss those research questions under headings that are the research questions. And that will make you think about your quantitative data, think about your qualitative data, and then think about how they converge, diverge, uh, elaborate, and so forth uh, in terms of mixed methods research uh, under separate headings and in separate discussions, yeah? And then you can bring it all together in the conclusion section, yeah? Uh, so research questions of the mixed methods sort ought to be something you think about including if you're going to do mixed methods research. Um, I have a number of references. Uh, these refer back to things that I talked about in the, my first book on stats, my survey research book. That article in 2004 on research methods and applied linguistics where I explored the qual-quant continuum, uh, and that's in the handbook of applied linguistics. Uh, and then my mixed methods research book where I bring together everything in qual-quant and mixed methods research. Yeah. There are also some other references that I had in my slides that you may want to go look at, particularly perhaps uh, Ongwegbuzi and Johnson, uh, and maybe Johnson, Ongwegbuzi, and Turner. Those are very seminal uh, sorts of uh, studies, not studies, but articles about mixed methods research that you may want to explore. Okay, uh, we've covered a lot of ground. I see that 133 of you have stuck with me, uh, so you must have found something about this uh, intriguing or interesting. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that that will lead to lots of questions uh, because we now have about 20 minutes that we should devote to questions and answers, yeah? Uh, so let me end with uh, this slide and we'll stay on that while we answer questions. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown, for this uh, uh, information and uh, interesting webinar presentation. Uh, uh, just uh, to let you know if you have any questions, uh, you need to click on the Q&A icon uh, at the bottom of the home screen uh, to send your questions. 
And also, I would like to invite Dr. Abdullah Al Milhi, the Dean of the College of Languages and Translation, to uh, chair this session. So, Dr. Abdullah, the mic is yours, so you can present the questions uh, that appears on uh, in the Q and A section. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Jide. Uh, you know, um, I'm glad to see you again, though you are far away. Um, I've, been to Saudi, that, I've been to Saudi yeah. Arabia 18 times. Uh, I'd love oh, to go again sometime. Yeah. Well, I, uh, first, I uh, would like to uh, welcome all of you. It's been, uh, you know, at the end of the year. This webinar, but I uh, would like to welcome everybody and thank everyone who um, joined us, uh, either our, our uh, colleagues from KKU or from elsewhere, which is outside the KKU, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, you know we had uh, uh, about 135 uh, participants, and now we have about 133, which is really good. Um, you know, um, even though the time there is uh, around nine o'clock in Hawaii, it's uh, almost 10 o'clock here and, and we have the finals nowadays and uh, I thank everyone for you know making the, the effort to attend this one and you know during the webinar we received two messages from our vice dean reminding uh, our colleagues of the invigilation and proctoring tomorrow morning so I thank I would like to thank everyone who participated and you know took some time like being you know, the, the um, final exams. This shows their eagerness and interest in, in, is in this informative and fruitful presentation. And I'd like to thank those who joined us from outside the KKU and we would, uh, inshallah, next semester we will have more webinars. Uh, I also would like to thank Dr. Munasser for, for uh, doing a lot, you know, uh, arrangements to have, uh, you know, the uh, previous weapon this one conducted. And uh, thanks go uh, go turning for helping us and for being there for us. Uh, I would like to mention just two names or three names, and I I don't want to mention names, but I have to. Uh, Dr. Fahad al ahmari from the Dean of, of E-Learning, and uh, Mr. Riyadh, uh, who has been with us for the three sessions in a row and following up. Uh, this webinar was a successful one. We had no problems whatsoever. The voice was, was clear. <clears throat> um, I would like to thank also, um, you know, Professor Dede for this summative presentation in which he combined um, both his rich experience in, in, in education and, and research, and also um, you know, his, his experience in, in music, which he mentioned earlier. And I'm so surprised you know, that you had this um, talent uh, you know, uh, along with your research and, and, um, and, and um, you know, education record. You know, had we uh, knew about it, we would have asked you when you visited us here in Abha to play some, you know, uh, some music for us. Uh, we had the honor for those who, do, who um, joined us lately, we had the honor to, to uh, Professor J.D. as one of our keynote speakers back in uh, 2014 in our symposium, national symposium on present and future of English in Saudi Arabia research concerns in which he stayed with us for almost, you know, a week and he uh, enriched, enriched us for, you know, uh, and the department and uh, he, he went also over our, uh, uh, you know, MA uh, programs. Now, I will go back to the questions and, uh, uh, you know, because uh, I started having only about six and now we have 17, almost 17 uh, questions. Now, let's go from the beginning, Dr. Um, uh, Professor J.D., and I want you, if possible, to be you know, quick and, and, and precise. Uh, we have from uh, Haifa, Thakfan, is the reliability for pretests necessary in conducting quantitative and qualitative research? 
This is the first question from Haifa, and she's asking about the reliability for pretest and is it necessary in conducting quantitative and qualitative research? And I will, you know, hand it to you. Okay, well, the notion of reliability is certainly a precondition. I think that's what you're asking. Is it a precondition for uh, good measurement in any study? So if you're doing quantitative research, you certainly want to have reliable measures um, because that simply means that they are systematic. If they're not systematic, they are random. And so you want to determine the degree to which your measures are systematic or reliable. Um, in qualitative research, uh, we're concerned about the same issue. Are our results systematic? Uh, and we, we look at that in terms not of reliability, but in terms of dependability. And of course, reliability and dependability are preconditions for having a decent study. Uh, the qualitative dependability is typically looked at in terms of uh, time triangulation, location triangulation, and those sorts of things to see if we're getting consistent results across locations, across times, and so forth. Uh, I hope that answers your question. It did. Uh, the answers keep coming, so uh, we, you know, we will uh, be. Um, uh, we we have the second one from anonymous attendee. I think most of our research, our researches are quantum but will you survey again? What do you think? Now, people do not have extra time to fill the survey honestly. So, is there another two tool to use instead uh, of MMR? Uh, well, of course, yes. I mean, an MMR study can be based on uh, any number of different uh, tools. You can certainly have questionnaires, but you could also have test results. Uh, you could have uh, any, any kind of quantitative data that you can count. So you could actually count the frequencies of, of turns that people take in class and so forth. So I mean, any kind of quantitative data can be combined with any kind of qualitative data um, in a mixed methods research study uh, as, as, and it depends on how, how uh, where you're headed with the study, what you want to learn from the study, uh, what your what your constraints are in your particular situation, and so forth. Uh, we're certainly not. I used an example of a questionnaire, uh, but that's not the only way to gather data for sure. Um, I don't know about the issue of honesty. I I know that people get uh, get very frenzied, but if you can get them interested in the study enough, interested enough, uh, and to give honest answers, then it will give you pretty solid data. Um, but I, I don't know your situation. Yeah, thank you. Okay, this is from uh, Mr. Aziz Salafi, Dr. Brown, from your, your experience, is there a real pure qual or pure quan, pure person into consideration or aspects of research? Uh, that's an interesting question. I think, yeah, there is. I mean, there are people, like I mentioned, my, co my colleague, uh, Gabby Cosper is her name. Uh, she does conversation analysis, interaction analysis, and that is purely qualitative, and she doesn't count anything. And in fact, in those traditions, in those research traditions, counting is looked down on. They don't want to count anything. And so that would be pure qualitative research. Pure quantitative research, yeah, I've done things myself where there are only numbers. You can look at in recent issues of language testing where I have uh, uh, heavy stat statistical studies that have no qualitative data at all. Um, but in the practical world of things like needs analysis, evaluation, curriculum development, uh, and many other kinds of research, I think that um, various combinations of, of the two types of data are going to work best. Okay, thank you. Um, there are two questions from uh, Mr. Uh, Mutahar Qasim. Uh, I will combine the, uh, both questions together. Uh, he says, thank you too much for such highly professional and academic presentation. Is it possible to support your explanation with quantitative and quantitative studies? Qualitative, so, sorry, quantitative? Oh, I think he meant quantitative and qualitative. The studies that show the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. And I believe, you know, you went, I think he asked this question prior to, you know, highlighting this issue. I think you did. Uh, but uh, you free to add if, what, uh, if you want to add something. And the second one, what is the right statistical method to analyze Leckert's scale? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, in fact, I suppose we could set up studies that would look at the strengths and weaknesses of quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, but in fact, uh, experience will show you almost immediately that, for instance, that first strength of qualitative data that you get information that you didn't expect. It happens all the time when you're gathering qualitative data. Uh, and it's really interesting just to watch. I don't need research to show me that that's happening. Um, at the same time, I know that one of the, the problems with, with quantitative research is that uh, I only get answers to the questions I ask. Uh, and to some degree, experience has shown me that that's, that's absolutely all, almost always the case. However, because of my training and now my background in both types of research, I'm realizing that uh, it's not as cut and dried as that. So, I mean, your question is a valid one, I think. Your other question about Likert scales, there's a good deal of literature that, that debates the issue of how to analyze Likert scales. Some people think that they are, uh, they are ordinal scales, which is 100% wrong as far as I'm concerned. Some people that they are, think they are nominal scales, which is also largely wrong, I believe. And so you, you may have noticed in my table that I calculated means and standard deviations for each of my Likert scale questions. That indicates that I think of them as interval scales, that is to say, uh, scales where we know that the, like test scores or other other interval scales, where we know that the, the means and standard deviations make sense. But you will also have noticed that I, I reported the, the percentage of people who answered each of the options. Um, and that is actually thinking about the data in nominal terms. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Likert scale questions can be interpreted as as interval scales, but it's also useful to look at it, uh, look at them as nominal scales. Uh, so the issue is not again 100% clear cut, uh, but it is it is interesting to think about. I wrote an article on that issue that you can find in my CV. Um, it's available online. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, this is from Dr. Ahmed Al Faifi, and he's uh, uh, asking about translation. Have you done some studies on translation research? And I, I believe he, may, he means, you know, quantitative. Uh, I haven't personally, no. We have a center for translation and interpretation at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and those are the people that would know about that kind of research. Um, I participated in such a study one time, uh, but I don't know what the results of it were. Uh, I gave a lecture that, that people had to simultaneously translate. That must have been quite a task. Uh, into Portuguese, yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't answer your question because I just don't know. Okay, let's go to Mohammed Mahmoud Al Haq. Mr. Mohammed Mahmoud Al Haq is asking about is the mixed methods another paradigm? If so, how are we going to converse two different views in the mixed methods by qualitative and quantitative researchers? Yeah, the way that the literature is is framing it is as as a new paradigm. So the mixed methods research paradigm which is the third paradigm after quantitative paradigm, qualitative paradigm. I personally am not that interested in, in differentiating these things as separate paradigms, but rather in thinking about how they come together. And that's where mixed methods really has a strength. Uh, and so the ideas that I presented on convergence, divergence, elaboration, exemplification, and clarification uh, are the ways that I would say we need to focus on our data uh, from quantitative and qualitative uh, sides in order to make the mixed methods uh, part of our study work. Yeah. Yeah, the next question is from Wafa Saud. Um, and she's saying, I think exact replication of studies using MMR is nearly impossible. Replication of studies? Yeah, this is you know, a comment. She's saying yeah. that I think exact exact replication of studies using MMR is nearly impossible. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, recently, Porter put out a collection of articles on replication in our field. Um, and one of the interesting articles is by, uh, I've forgotten his name, he's a qualitative researcher. Uh, he makes the argument that qualitative research cannot be replicated. And if he's right, uh, then, uh, in fact, mixed methods research, which has a qualitative component, is going to be very difficult to replicate as well. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem, yeah. But replication is basically a concern in, uh, in quantitative research, yeah. 
uh, and it's a necessary concern because uh, we are so narrowly focused in such studies that we really do need to replicate. <clears throat> Nonetheless, if you look at research over, over time, uh, so mixed methods research studies done over time, uh, it's not impossible to find trends uh, through either meta-analysis or literature analysis um, that will lead to conclusions that are interesting. I, I hope I answered the question, yeah. Okay, I hope so. Uh, and the next question uh, says, how about terminologies to be used in mixed method or mixed method research? For example, results, quantitative, findings, qualitative, and what would be the mixed method term? I don't know if the question is, is understood. Mixed so methods interpretations, you know. mixed methods findings, mixed methods, you could use any of those terms, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. because it is a third set of, of analyses, basically. Okay, the next question is asking about results from a case. You know, I think uh, this, the, the answer is, is really hard. Go ahead, please. I didn't understand the question, uh, Dr. The question Obama. he's asking about a case study. Can yeah. we generalize uh, our findings of a case study? No. Yeah. No, but, but we can learn from a case study. So, for example, my, my wife's research with the six learners in Hawaii, uh, six learners of Japanese who, who grew up in Hawaii, uh, is a case study, no question about it. Uh, but, but she comes up with hypotheses from that case study, which can then move forward. We can test those hypotheses with larger samples and so forth. So case studies can be very useful as a basis or a starting point for other research uh, as well, yeah. Okay, the next question says, how to overcome the possible contradictory results of the qualitative and quant uh, quantitative and qualitative analysis of the data? I don't think, I mean, I think that the, the interesting way to look at the qualitative and quantitative uh, divergencies or say disagreements in your data is not that you want to overcome them, but you want to understand them, yeah. Uh, and for, for example, the example that I gave you of, of the contradiction between the students' views of pair work and the teachers' views of pair work, if you can look at the qualitative data and come to understand why that's occurring, then, then you've, you've actually learned something uh, from the contradictions that you're finding in your data. Um, let me add that uh, in my research over the last 30, 40 years now, I have found time after time that study one has an anomaly in it that, that I don't understand, and that leads me to do study two, which tries to figure out why that anomaly occurred. And I can see chains in my research, like in my closed testing research, where I've gone from study to study to study to study, learning from each study something that was contradictory that actually led me to, to the curiosity and, and the questioning of that issue in a second study or framing the study in a new way so that I could answer that question. Uh, and the long chain of results ultimately led me to some very interesting conclusions, yeah. Okay, I lost some of the questions. Anyway, there is a, this question says, how did you manage your quantitative data you had collected? I see you have, you have diverse data because you administered open-ended questions and answers varied with different topics with different opinions. Right. The, questions, the question is how you dealt with the diversity in answer and come up with conclusion. Okay. Uh, when I was an assistant professor, I dealt with the data by working long hours, <laughs> very hard, entering my own data, uh, analyzing my data, and so forth. Uh, but in more recent years, for instance, in the Country X study, Mohammed actually uh, sent out the questionnaires, gathered the data, uh, entered the data into an Excel spreadsheet for me. Um, and so over time, I found that it, gets, it has gotten much easier to handle my data like that. But large data sets, whether they're qualitative or quantitative, um, mean working hard. I mean, a lot of work, uh, which meant that Sometimes I had to get up at five o'clock in the morning and work two hours every day before my kids got ready for school and take, take them to school and then go to work and do my teaching. So, I mean, you have to find ways to do it. It takes time. Uh, good research takes time. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Dr. Razumer is asking, how should a researcher deal with the situation when quantity quality results diverge much? 
Well, again, uh, I mean, the idea of divergence is actually, to me, a very positive thing. Yeah. When they converge, that's nice. But all that does is really, uh, it affirms your preconceptions when you start. It's the divergences, the anomalies, the surprises uh, that oftentimes lead me, uh, and I think lead a lot of researchers into new areas that open up uh, new knowledge and actually contribute much more to the field. So dealing with those uh, is actually focusing on them in my in my view. Okay, and um, the next question, how can I measure the reliability and validity of my questionnaires? Oh, for the Likert scale questions you, on your questionnaire, you can use uh, something like Kronbach Alpha. Uh, if you've got uh, my testing book or any, any good testing book, uh, you can find Kronbach Alpha in there and calculate it for your Likert scale questions. Um, you have to do that carefully because uh, sometimes reliability is not necessarily a good thing. If your questions are doing different things, you may not want them to be reliable, but rather want them to be reliable in subsets. So you might have five items that are doing one thing, five items doing another thing. Separate reliability estimates for each of those will help you understand your questionnaire better. Um, reliability, of course, ranges from zero to one. And if you're getting reliabilities for five questions that are 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you're doing quite well. Uh, the rest of that question was, uh, you, you've got also open-ended questions and how you deal with reliability for open-ended questions is you don't. You would probably think more in terms of dependability. And one way to deal with that would be to, to code your, your questionnaires using some scheme those open-ended questions, and then ask another researcher to code, say, 10%, and look at the degree to which you're agreeing uh, in terms of a percentage. So what percentage of your codes using your scheme did the two researchers agree on? And that's an estimate of the dependability of your qualitative data. Okay, the next question is uh, similar to that, in, in this, to the first, uh, previous one. Will the type of research like quantitative, qualitative, uh, qualitative, quantitative, MR, MMR, upon the talk of the availability of sources or the, the measure? I don't know how to answer that question because I didn't understand part of it. Uh, could you repeat we, we it? We can skip it. Okay. Let's... Know, it's, the Muhammad is will the type of research like qualitative, quantitative, MMR, depend upon the topic or the availability of resources or the mood of the researcher? Okay, that's, that's an interesting, nice question. Um, um, <laughs> will the type of research, like qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods research depend on the topic? Yes, I think it should. Um, some topics lend themselves to qualitative, others to quantitative, uh, and still other topics tend to lend themselves to the, to the mixed methods research. Availability of resources, of course, will have something to do with the choices that you make. Um, and as you, as you go along in your career, it's much easier to do, I found when I was an assistant professor, a whole series of little quantitative studies um, than it is to actually think about your data. And, and when you're doing mixed methods research or qualitative data research, you have to, you have to really think about your data. Um, but as I became a more mature researcher, I was able to think about qualitative data and how they combined with qualitative data and then mixed methods research um, in ways that make me a much more powerful researcher. So as the, the availability of researchers, resources has increased in my career, which it definitely does as you move ahead, uh, both because you, you increase your rank academically and because you become, you connect with more and more people and get more resources that way. Uh, I think that that's, that's probably resources and topic are the two key issues that you have to think about in terms of what kind of research, quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods you're going to do. As for the mood of the researcher, I think that tends to swing uh, depending on the time of day. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that has much effect on my research. Okay. Um, we'll take, uh, you know, I'm going to take uh, another one or two questions. I know that it is... Um, you know, past already past ten o'clock, and I know that you're also busy. So um, we'll take uh, another two questions, if it's okay, Professor okay. Day. Sure. Uh -huh. Okay. This one is a quick uh, question. How can we balance both quantitative and qualitative measures? 
at the same, I believe she, uh, she means or he means this. Is it possible to, to balance those you know, types of resources? I think that what, what I find happening is that the balance of the two sort of grows out of the study. Yeah. I mean, I try to balance them all the time, but what, what ends up happening in the, in the final report is often that I've, I've ended up with a, a predominantly quantitative study um, with a little bit of qualitative um, or a lot of qualitative, you know, depending on what I've done uh, or vice versa. Uh, and so I think the study itself will, will determine the balance. But if you shoot for a 50-50 balance, uh, then what ends up happening is probably what needs to happen. In this one comment, I think Thomas is best for the that depends on your study you need. Is it, is that right? Um, I'm or sorry. What do you need? Dr. Halmami, I, you know, I, person, I can't I can't understand you. I think no method uh, he, he wants to say there is no best method on your study. I believe this is the question. What he, he you're breaking up. You're breaking up. Can you repeat the question? Okay. Well, I'm gonna, I believe he, he means uh, uh, there is no best method. It depends on study and what you need in that study. Is that right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, in fact, in some cases, there is a best method in the sense that if you do co conversation and, and interaction analysis, that's the best method. Um, probably, yeah. Um, but it is determined by topic and it is determined by resources and, and it is determined to some degree by uh, the needs of the study, what you're trying to accomplish, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go back to Ismail Ravai. What is the difference between empirical and experimental research? Uh, empirical research can be qualitative or quantitative. It's simply based on data, yeah. Experimental research is research that uh, draws a random sample from a population, like medical research does, uh, and then randomly assigns people to treatment and control groups. It's that kind of research that's experimental. Uh, so um, experimental research is one kind of empirical research, but there are many, uh, as I've outlined above. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really uh, apologize for those uh, who said the question and we could cover all of them. The time is a bit late. No, Dr. Nasser has been in his office since early in the morning. And tomorrow, I have existing, uh, thank you, Professor J. Day, for this wonderful, informative, and uh, you know, presentation in which you uh, actually enriched our uh, you know uh, knowledge and experience in, 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 in combining different types of research, and you squeezed and and you milked in more than thirty-five of years of your experience in a very short. Uh, time. So okay. thank you uh, again and thanks to everyone. And I'm handing the mic to Dr. Munasar if he wants to add something. Thanks everyone for attending and uh, our colleagues and also those who joined us from, uh, you know, elsewhere other than, uh, I mean, outside KKU. Let, me also, say, let me, me also say. Yeah, hope to see you again. Yeah, yeah, please. The, the, the let me also say yes. mahalo. Mahalo, which is the Hawaiian word uh, for shukran. Uh, thank you very much for your questions and for your kind attention. Um, uh, and the best of luck to all of you. Happy New Year. Thank you. You too. Mm -hmm. Dr. Nasser. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for uh, chairing this session. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, many of you asked me questions uh, about the PowerPoint slides. Inshallah, the, uh, Professor Brown will send me the, the PowerPoint uh, presentation, and then I will send it to you by email. Uh, later, inshallah, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, Professor Brown. Thanks uh, goes also to the e-learning deanship and also to our colleagues at the Faculty of Languages and Transition. And this is the conclusion of our webinar. Uh, this is our last webinar this semester. And then, inshallah, I will see you uh, next semester with the, another webinar that we are arranging now. 
thank you so much and uh, inshallah we'll see you next semester thanks and you can leave